And welcome to TGen Talks, a live edition. We don't do this every month. I'm Carrie Dozer. We do a podcast every month, but usually it's just me with a scientist from TGen. Today, we have a live studio audience, which is pretty fun. So thanks for taking part in our little experiment. Subject of tonight's podcast is aging. There's not a single person watching or listening who's excited about getting older. Nobody's looking forward to forgetting what they went to the store to get or not being able to take that hike up Camelback like they've been doing every week for the last 20 years or so. But the truth of the matter is, every single one of us got a day older today, and we will get a day older tomorrow. Those are the facts. Our guests today are going to help us do that the most gracefully that we possibly can. Optimize our aging, if you will. So, this episode of TGen Talks has two live guests in, in studio with us, Dr. Nick Short and Dr. Matt Huntelman. Thanks guys for taking, play, taking part in our experiment. Thanks for having us. Yep, absolutely. You are both TGen researchers who are experts in the field of aging. You more in the physical sense and you more in the brain or mental sense. If everybody listening could find a path to the fountain of youth, I'm sure you would give them the directions, but obviously we're not there yet. Let's start with you, Nick. Um, your area of research involves our physical selves, how our bodies age over time. Most of us listening, watching, taking part today, our physical selves peaked years ago. Is there an age at which our physical selves are at their best? Well, unfortunately, there's no consensus on this. Uh, some people think that aging starts at conception. Other people think it starts at birth. Other people after puberty. Other people midlife. Uh, I think where I come from, uh, un aging unfortunately starts at conception because there are processes that are kicked off and, and start that actually start to accumulate damage to the body. So we need to basically take care of ourselves throughout our entire lives. That's pretty discouraging. Nobody's thinking about aging at conception or in their teens or probably in their 20s That's true. either. It's true. So what are we supposed to do about it? Well, there's uh, some obvious things to do. I mean, keep fit, to eat right, to all these sorts of things. But uh, as you maybe uh, encounter signs of disease, you definitely should take care of them. You know, there's no question. Is our human body as it exists today designed to live 80 or 90 years? Because on average, men in the United States live 77 years and women live 81 years. Are we set up for this at this point in time? Again, no consensus, but there is a belief that there is a maximum to the human lifespan. It's around 120 years. And so a lot of efforts and sort of research I do and certainly Matt are really to extend the health span of people rather than the lifespan. So give people as many healthy years as possible if in fact there's an upper limit to human lifespan. Matt, you study the human brain and how it ages over time. Is there an age at which our human brain is at its best? It's a great question and the answer is somewhat complicated because it really depends on what brain function you're talking about. So it's really interesting because things like a certain type of memory might peak in the 20s. But for other things like vocabulary, we know that that peaks much later in life. But there's another twist to it as well, and that is we can all beat the odds. So uh, in our studies of large groups of people as they age normally, we can see people who still perform on these cognitive tests, these memory tests, as if they were many decades younger. So that's kind of the fun side of this as well, is that you can beat the odds. It's not necessarily the hand you're dealt, deal with it. That's you right. Can yeah. have some have some positive effect. Yeah. Everyone listening or watching probably has one person in mind. It's somebody at work, it's somebody at their gym, it's somebody they encounter on a fairly regular basis who never, ever, ever seems to get older. You want to know what she's taking, you yeah. want to know what he's eating. What, what do they do at home? Why are they not getting any older? Is, is that their genetic makeup or is that most likely a combination of their lifestyle, their diet, their, where they live, their environment? What is it? How much is chance and how much is not? So clearly there's a genetic component to aging, but it doesn't actually explain a lot. So you could predict someone's lifespan from birth, but the 
error bars on those predictions are pretty big. So you, you've got to take those sorts of predictions with a grain of salt. And that's because, hopefully this will come out uh, more in full as we talk, things you can do to sustain a healthy life. And of course, that's what people are after, trying to figure out just what it is that we can do to combat the bad genes we might have. And what about the lady at work who never seems to forget a thing? And she must be going on 70. Isn't it time for her to retire? What about that person whose brain is eternally young? It, it's, it's the same story. It's not all genetics. So we know very clearly it's a combination of both your lifestyle, your health, your medical factors, and your genetics. It just turns out that genetics is one of the things that's a little bit easier to study yeah. than uh, you know, your environment, your lifestyle. Is that because uh, people aren't honest about their lifestyle? Well, they're not honest, but also, you know, what did you have for breakfast last week on Monday, Carrie? It's, yeah. it's kind of hard to remember a lot of things that are daily choices that we make. Right. Let's talk about the concept of blue zones, these places in the world where people tend to live longer as a group. You and I talked about this earlier. What is a blue zone and why the heck do people tend to live to be 95 and yeah. actively 95? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, blue zones are just as you said. These are places throughout the world where, for whatever reason, there tends to be a longer uh, lifespans for people that uh, you know, have somehow found healthy lifestyles. Most of the research suggests that uh, keeping physically active, no surprise, is one thing. Eating right is another. Having social support is incredibly crucial, and this has been hammered home time and time again in, in research projects, I'm sure Matt would agree. So it's not just the environment, not just your genes, uh, but your social life that is important too. What about the brains of these people? You visited one of these blue zones, didn't you? Yeah, I, I'm, I had the privilege to visit uh, some centenarians in Okinawa. Uh, people, 100 plus. People who have lived over 100 <laughs> years. and. Uh, as Nick mentioned, it was really striking. These, these individuals were still very independent, but the beautiful thing was that their family was sort of right out their back door. So they lived in these familial communities with different generations who um, probably kept them really thinking and being much younger than they really were. It was really quite striking how different that is than sort of a typical household that we grew up in here in the US. What's become typical in the United States is instant access to everything, any food that you want, anything that you, anything that you want, you can basically order to be delivered to your home. We don't have to go anywhere anymore. Um, is that, as you look at these blue zones, is that in direct contrast to the way these people are living? I would say yes. You know, they have uh, more limited access to food. So um, the Amalfi Coast in, in Italy is another blue zone. And uh, the sorts of food that people have access to is much different. A lot of it is grown locally. Uh, it's kind of organic. Um, so not as much processed food. Mm -hmm. So there's a pretty strong correlation between the amount of processed food one eats and their health and cognitive abilities later in life. So if these aren't in the orbit of the people who live in these blue zones, it's probably contributing to their health at some level. They probably have to think about what they're going to eat and plan it. So that's a mental process sure. that many of us don't need to go through anymore. And that's really important. Think of all the steps involved, even just in creating your weekly grocery list, right? You have to, you have, to have a craving for a certain food. You have to imagine that recipe. Maybe you have to write it out or find it. And then you have to plan on what you need to purchase. So it's it's actually a pretty interesting, uh, sort of cognitively challenging process to, mm -hmm. to plan out something as simple as, what am I gonna eat this week? Yeah, well, but I, I think Nick brought up something really important, and this is the, the aspect of these processed foods. And new research just came out this week uh, that him and I were talking about by email, uh, showing that uh, you know, a diet too reliant on these processed foods can actually be bad cognitively. And that was really surprising to us, but it was certainly a, a large study and uh, fairly convincing that we need to make sure we're not relying too much on these uh, super processed foods. Seems like your, the email thread between the two of you would be pretty interesting. Nah. <laughs> Maybe you'd be willing to make <laughs> that not. public. We could all learn a little bit of something. Um, Matt, obviously studying the brain, you know a lot about Alzheimer's disease and deal with a lot of people whose family members have it or who have it themselves. I feel like most Americans are highly aware of Alzheimer's, what it means, and, and I would say that most people fear it. 
I think yeah. it's a number one thing. You probably get it from friends and neighbors. I, you know, how do I know that I'm not going to get Alzheimer's? Is that fear justified um, just based on the numbers? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think it's natural to fear it because it's so striking when it happens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you know someone with Alzheimer's disease, very few people would say would choose that, right? Yeah. So yes, it makes total sense to be fearful, but the statistics don't necessarily support that. So this is not our destiny. Uh, only a small fraction of us over the age of 65 end up with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, yes, as, as you start to take slices of the population that are older and older, that risk increases, but it starts out as low as 10 or 11%. So it is not uh, really the predestiny of, of us as we age. So I would never say the fear is not unfounded, but it's, it certainly uh, shouldn't dominate your thoughts about, well, this is what's going to happen as I get older. What about genetic markers? Obviously, now you can screen for a probability. Yeah. Is, that, is that reliable data? Is it something that people should do if they have a concern? This is really a personal decision. So we do a pretty good job of using genetics to estimate your risk for Alzheimer's disease, but the key word is risk. Mm -hmm. So it is not, there is not a way for me to look into your future. With exceptions of very rare forms of Alzheimer's disease, we can do that with very rare forms, but the most common form that we're all concerned about, we can't look into your future with absolute certainty. So some people, feel empowered by that. They want to know if they have higher risk because they're going to do things. They're going to change maybe their planning, mm -hmm. uh, their savings. They're going to change their wills. And some people say, well, I can't do anything about it, so I don't want to know. So that's why I say it's a personal decision. But I also don't think um, it's not a slam dunk right now. So that's why I can't, I wouldn't make a blanket recommendation mm -hmm. that this is what you should do. That's why I think it's personal. Does when someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and it's it, it is an official diagnosis, it, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a question after a certain point in time, is there a physical ramification of it, or sure. is it purely a brain disease? No, there's physical manifestations. But just to, to the point, um, and I'll share this story with you. So there is a gene, it's called the APOE gene, one gene that Matt has studied and his colleagues. And there's a change that some people have in that gene which causes them to have greater susceptibility to Alzheimer's. I carry that gene. Uh, my mother had Alzheimer's disease, so I have been paying attention to developments in how to prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. So there's no question this, this one particular gene change in the, in the APOE gene, if you have, makes you more susceptible. But as we're talking about, that is not necessarily a guarantee that you're not gonna a death develop sentence. Alzheimer's. So there's much that one can do. In fact, there's a, there's a joke out there that I've used uh, before, and that is, as we age, we rely less on memory and more on memoranda. So I write things down, yeah. I take steps uh, to make sure that I've got things uh, coordinated, and uh, you know, uh, wish I had done more of this with my, with my mother to yeah. sort of get her to kind of be more active in, in preparing her day and, and taking part to sort of get her more involved in, in you know, thinking about things. Yeah. So what about those physical ramifications? Aside from not remembering a basic thing like how to drive or where you live or getting lost in your own neighborhood, what are those physical ramifications? Uh, so it's, it's interesting. With the APOE gene, there's probably not as many physical uh, kind of correlations as there are with the more cognitive deficits. But there are other genetic factors which clearly contribute to both cognitive decline in age and kind of physical decline in age. And they affect certain processes. We won't go through the technical details, but uh, sort of the way your cells are powered. There's an uh, organelle called the mitochondria in your cells, and those tend to wind down and contribute to aging. So there's known to be genetic factors that kind of complicate the powerhouse of your, of your cell, and those contribute to both cognitive deficits as well as physical deficits. What can the average person, not having any knowledge of their genetic risk for Alzheimer's, what can that average person do to put themselves at ease and know that they're, they're doing whatever they can to either prevent it or prevent the symptoms of it? Because as we age, a lot of people experience different kinds of dementia. It doesn't have to be Alzheimer's. But right. what is it that we can do to our brains now and every day until we get to be 90, hopefully, to help keep that from happening? 
get this question a lot, Carrie, and I think uh, it's, it's one of those that drives our current research as well. So what, what can you do? There's a long list of things that we know have scientific evidence to support brain health. The interesting thing for the audience is that most of those are also supportive of body health. Mm -hmm. So good for your body, good for your brain. Things like eating well, eating a balanced diet, eating a healthy diet, getting the necessary sleep that you need each night. Some people it's seven hours, others it's nine. Find out what you need and don't skimp on your sleep. Uh, exercise, both strength training and aerobic exercise. And another big one is uh, socialization. Get out there, do things. Uh, come to an event like this, meet new people, uh, hear new things. That's just four on the list, okay? The list gets really long. So I think what the problem is, that list gets too long. It gets daunting. I don't have time for it all. Right. Some people say, well, I want to do all those every day because I want to I wanna really help my brain, so I'm going to do all the things on the list. Uh, and that's just too difficult. There's not enough time. So one of the things that Nick and I are trying to do together is to understand how we can prioritize this list for an individual person. Yep. So for you, if you only had an hour, what should you do? Should you focus on cooking the best food? Should you focus on exercise? Should you focus on socialization? We don't know that answer just yet. That's why our list is so long. So we want to find out a way to recommend prioritized things to each person individually. What should you do now that has the biggest bang for your buck, biggest bang for your investment of time? Is there any truth to the idea or merit to the idea that what it is that you want to go do. I'll just say, personally, in our family, I would be the one to go to the gym, whereas our daughter would sit and do a crossword puzzle if you give us one hour, right? Now yeah. she's going to get help, right? Yeah. She's going to ask everybody in the family for answers. But <laughs> this is how we do crossword puzzles. Yeah. So, so that, those are the two things that feed us. Is there any merit to the idea that that might be what we're supposed to do based on our genetic makeup? I think yes, and in, in fact, uh, echo what Matt said, there's, there's some truth to the fact that these kind of preventive strategies should be personalized. So I just told you that for me, I have this copy of this bad gene that mm -hmm. predisposes me to Alzheimer's. Not many people have that, uh, certainly not many people in the room probably. So I need to be on the lookout for you know, things associated with cognitive decline, but that's not true of other people. Uh, physically, I'm doing fine. My family, for whatever reason, seems to be blessed with good physical genes. So you know, we're all uh, kind of fit, it can uh, handle uh, stressors of one sort or another. So for me, it's more cognitive impairments and less on the physical side, but you can imagine the opposite for somebody else. Might you be in the right line of work for somebody who has this genetic makeup? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, people typically choose professions that have something you know to do with sure. uh, you know their own personal But you had no so, idea uh, when you no chose, idea this when I chose this right we've all heard the phrase use it or lose it i'm sure that there's truth to that mantra both physically and mentally how do we <laughs> as we age we probably fall into some comfortable patterns right we do things that might be easier how do we as Americans who live in a country with access to everything, an abundance of everything, how do we continue to find things that challenge us? Because as we were talking about before we started this, we could watch Netflix all day, every day. We could, we could entertain ourselves endlessly. How do we find the good work to do to keep our brains working? Yeah, I, I, I think it's really important, but I don't know that I have the, the perfect answer. I, I think that's another one of these personalized things but I do think it's important to hear that this is really critical. Uh, you know, the variety being the spice of life, that, that's a saying because of its influence on our brain and body health. And so certainly that is very, very important. Uh, how we solve that for everybody is still a difficult question. We're just coming out of the COVID pandemic, and I would say coming out of, it's not over certainly, but we, we're back on planes, we're back in offices, we're back to normal life. But there was a long stretch of time where gyms were closed and socialization was limited for just about everybody. What effect does that have on, I'll start with you, Matt, on an older person living alone who has limited access to people anyway? What did COVID do to our brains? 
Well, we're seeing research come out now that across the whole aging spectrum, COVID had an influence on cognitive performance, learning in children, uh, various things like that. So, um, and I think at its root cause is the lack of socialization, especially for the older population. It's uh, the fact that many things that we were already doing uh, got shut down. Yep. And many things that we relied on uh, to meet other people, see our friends, um, those stopped. And those, we know those are important for brain health. I think one of the open questions, you know, not to be too gloom and doom, one of the open questions is, do we just rebound from that, right? So we're all back to normal now. Uh, we're having fun tonight, you know, hanging out together. Uh, do we rebound from that and do we recover? Or is it a long lasting effect? Is there some lastic influence? Yeah. My gym closed, my favorite place to go work out in the morning closed, won't ever reopen, that's gone. What did, if people wanted to find a way to exercise, they did, mm -hmm. but what did COVID do to our physical selves? Yeah, well, it, it set it, us back a couple centuries. It, it definitely <laughs> did, sadly. Uh, people took up, uh, you know, poor eating habits, did all sorts of other things that really contributed to kind of physical decline. But there's another factor we should really think seriously about that contributes to aging. We had mentioned, you know, bad diets. We had, we mentioned the need to exercise. Uh, we mentioned uh, sleep. Uh, there's also trying to avoid stress. Uh, which is not easy, especially in times like uh, mm -hmm. COVID, right, where there was nothing if not stress people were associated with schools uh, being shut down, uh, jobs being uncertain, uh, you know, this kind of apocalyptic vision of mm -hmm. things. There was nothing if not stress. So another thing people need to do to keep healthy for longer is somehow either learn to deal with stress or avoid those stressful situations. And they have their toll, stress has its toll on mental aspects of, of aging, uh, but also physical. Just look at a picture of the president when he takes the oath of office and eight years later when he yeah. leaves, he's like, he's like 80 years, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's multiplied sure. by 10. I think everyone uh, watching is familiar with um, ads, be they on commercial television or radio, um, or those that pop up on social media, just about everywhere. Everywhere you look, there is a product or a program or a something that is promises to take years off of your, your, your brain age or give you back the body of your youth. Let's play a little fact or fiction about some of these things. Um, because I, I think that it's important that people understand that there is science behind certain products that are out there, but behind a vast majority of them, probably not a lot. I'm dating myself here, but um, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when I worked at a local radio station, I was in charge of taking the Paul Harvey five minute news in and <laughs> producing it and giving it to someone so that it was ready for air. He would do a 60 second commercial every day for ginkgo biloba. He could talk nonstop about ginkgo biloba. He was angel, he and Angel were taking it and he swore that it would give you, you know, a, a brain 30 years ago. Anything to ginkgo biloba? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we started with this one because I think a lot of people have heard about ginkgo and it's, I still see it being recommended today. And starting with ginkgo gives us a chance to talk about how we uh, quote unquote prove things in science and medicine. And we use this very specific type of design. It's called a placebo double blind randomized trial. And what that means is the people who are participating don't know what they're getting. The doctors who are giving it to them don't know what they're getting. Everyone is blinded. And some people aren't even getting the active ingredient. Now, the problem is most of the things you talked about, most of the things we see advertised to us, don't go through this type of testing. Medicines that your doctor prescribes to you, maybe a blood pressure medicine or a cholesterol medicine, those have all gone through this type of testing. Mm -hmm. And it's the gold standard for truth. Is this beneficial or not? Ginkgo actually is one of the supplements that went through this randomized testing. And it was a big study. It took about eight or 10 years to do. And in the end, it turned out it had no influence, no positive effect on your cognitive performance and no positive effect on helping you avoid Alzheimer's disease. So when you hear folks talking about ginkgo nowadays, um, you really should look at them a little bit and, and wonder to yourself, 
are you up to date? Because this was, this was shown about uh, 15 years ago not to be effective. I wonder if anyone told Paul. Because he <laughs> was know. in. We'll just assume he was oblivious. We'll assume somebody let him know. Um, when I Google Alzheimer's prevention, I get a lot of combinations of medicines, supplements, take this, take that. The one that I most commonly see is vitamin C and vitamin E. Take massive quantities yeah. of them to prevent. What is the idea behind that, and is there any medical truth yeah. to it? So the, one of the ideas behind it is there, there are certain nutrients, like vitamin C, that are known to be essential to the body. And all that means is your body doesn't make them, so you depend critically on external sources, vitamin C, oranges, you know, other sorts of foods that have vitamin C. So the real obvious argument to make is, well, if you're depriving the body of something that it needs by not eating these foods that provide the external sources, of course your body is not gonna do well. Unfortunately, the links between essential nutrients like vitamin C and diseases is not been subjected to the sorts of tests Matt was describing to prove unequivocally. How right. could you? You'd need right. to track people a long time. There's any number of these nutrients that you'd have to test. I mean, no one has the money, the time, or the energy to test them all. So unfortunately, people are making claims about the, the utility or the benefits of these uh, nutrients uh, and vitamins and whatnot uh, without much substance behind them. Now, in this context, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, there are a number of kind of initiatives, many sponsored by the government, to convene panels to discuss what kind of evidence it would take to convince the average person that something is working. Mm -hmm. Like if you wanted to do the study, would it be the RCT, the randomized controlled trial of the type Matt described? Would it be something else? Is there a more efficient substitute that doesn't have to take 20 years to figure out? So these panels are trying to come to grips with the very sorts of issues that you're describing. There's all the stuff out there. A lot of it is misinformation. Some of it, quite frankly, is disinformation, like pretending that something works, knowing that it doesn't work. So there are, uh, again, panels out there, groups convened to sort of combat this stuff through science. I'm on one of these panels. Matt, if he's not on one of the panels, will be on one of the panels. And Should be on one of those panels for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Most commonly, I will read a, a following a claim like taking C and E, they will say, uh, the brains of people who were diagnosed with Alzheimer's were shown to be deficient in C and E. Yeah. And that is, that's purported to be the reasoning or the, the proof, so to speak. And that really doesn't prove anything, does it? Well, it, it, it might be the case, but that doesn't mean there's sort of a cause effect there. So there are many things that you can find that might be out of whack in, in someone's brain, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the causes for, say, the cognitive deficits they have. So you have to be careful with these things. And uh, fortunately, with colleagues like mm -hmm. Matt and other colleagues at TGen, we're putting the thinking caps on on how we can kind of correct the record for a lot of these things. And it, it's one of the things that's really interesting about Alzheimer's disease is that it takes for our best estimates, 15 to 20 years to fully develop. So the day that you start to experience cognitive problems that influence your daily life. You've had it for a while. You've had it for a while. And so we don't, we have a very poor understanding of what was going on 20 years ago. And that's where we're trying to push the science now. Understand those early steps because we think that might be some of the clues of what to treat, what to get in there and treat. So the point is, you know, when you look at a brain at death, you can see a lot of things are lower or even higher. And it's really hard to put those into sequence, which came right. first. Right. I got an ad on Instagram the other day for something called Active H2. This is, I wish I could play the ad, it's great. Um, it's a, the pitch is that uh, there, there are two tablets that the, uh, the salesman dropped into a glass of water and he said, this is molecular hydrogen infused in drinking water with a breakthrough open glass formula. And it, it fizzes just like an Alka-Seltzer. And, and his claim is that uh, it, it will infuse your water with molecular hydrogen gas. It's very small. And it, it will get into all areas of the body and basically cure whatever it is that's going on. Is there any, <laughs> is there any reason to believe a claim like this um, that finds you on social media? I, I would say with... Without knowing what they're basing it on, I would be very skeptical. You know, most of these sorts of claims should be backed by hard science. And if you see an advertisement in a, in a magazine, you know, there's usually in the fine print, 
This has not been tested on humans. Right. Yeah. And if you see that, I think you should run. If, it, if uh, there are references, uh, then you could ask someone, Matt, myself, anyone, scientific uh, friend or whatever, is this legitimate? Because there is a lot of hype out there that uh, there's just no scientific basis for it. Do you guys get really tired of answering questions from your friends and your neighbors about what they should be doing? No, because I learn about new things all the time. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the Alka-Seltzer drink. Yeah. I'll send you the ad. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send that along. It, bottom line, it sounds like all of your advice, I won't even call them tips because they're not products. It's just ways to live. All of this is free. All of the things that you're talking about, obviously, a good diet might cost a little bit more, and it's not very convenient. But these aren't supplements, these aren't programs, this isn't anything extra. This is all something that really should cost nothing. Yeah, well, they cost time and effort, though, and I think that isn't necessarily free. You have to, you have to actually make a choice. And I feel like that's difficult for us as humans, right? Like you said, we can all sit at home and can order anything I want. Yeah, binge on the on the newest Netflix show and order anything we want to our doorstep. So I think that's perhaps one of the things that we struggle with is actually making that choice. Um, so you know, yeah, they are free, but I think there's still a little bit of activation energy, as we would say in the science world, you know, to to get over that hump. Yep. So not to put a dollar sign on it, but January headline reads something like this. Jeff Bezos wants to never get old, invests in anti-aging company. The number is $3 billion in a, a company that has some legit pharmaceutical executives and physicians. This isn't a lark. $3 billion. It's obviously a huge investment, and he's not the only one doing it. How big a number is that, as far as medical research is concerned? Because it sounds giant to me. But I'll ask each of you, Nick, first, if you had $3 billion to invest in something, where would you start? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And I wish I did have $3 billion to invest <laughs> in this area. Um, I, I would probably uh, spread the wealth a little bit in, in terms of identifying things that might shed light on how we could lead healthier lives. With companies like Altos Labs, the, the Bezos Lab, and Calico, which is the Google equivalent to Altos, has their own $3 billion budget. They're focusing on one or another things, and I think from my perspective, that might be limiting, uh, because we know there are multiple things. We just went through a bunch that contribute to, to kind of healthy aging. And so I would, uh, again, take multiple shots on goal, probably not confine attention to any one. I think that pretty much what I'd argue about. Yeah, yeah three, billion. <laughs> three billion. Where are you going? For, first, that three billion number is is greater than what the federal government funds on a yearly basis for research Everything. in this area. Yeah, yeah, so that's a that's a big number, um, but it's deserved. Uh, this topic needs this attention. Uh, how I would spend it is really uh, getting focus back on the U.S. public trying to get them engaged in science, get as much participation as we can from all walks of life. Because that's really, really important for us as we study this complicated process of aging. And it's really important that when we make findings, which turn into public health suggestions, that we're making the suggestions to the right people at the right time for the right reason. Sure. And because of that, we need uh, you know, really the involvement of our whole population. It sounds grandiose, but it's, it's really, really an important part of this. Not so many people out there participate in scientific research, but yet a lot of us reap the benefits of those, you know, of the new drugs uh, that we need to survive or the new things that we learn about our brain or our heart or our lungs. Uh, and so we need more participation to make it richer, make it stronger. Broader. Broader. All right, last chance. Any secrets? Is there anything that either of you two do or take or drink <laughs> on a daily basis that you feel needs some attention? <laughs> Any secrets? For, for me, it's exercise, uh, uh, avoid stress to the degree that's possible in a somewhat stressful That'd environment. That'd be the hardest thing. The hardest thing, that's yeah. Hard. <laughs> uh, I, um, 
yeah, I uh, eat right, uh, or at least uh, try to eat right. Um, and I actually do pay attention, probably because of the nature of my, my job, to developments in this area. Mm -hmm. So if, in fact, there looks like there's a truly science-backed supplement or uh, emerging therapeutic to kind of take care of whatever issue you might have, I just want it on my radar. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, to Matt's point about kind of getting people engaged, part of that is going to have to involve exposure, just letting people know what the truth is in certain areas, and it's, it's crucial. So I try to stay abreast of that stuff, you know, as a consumer of these yeah. products, not just as a scientist. When you find it, call me. Yeah. Matt, yeah. anything? My answer is similar to his. I, I do take uh, a few supplements, you know, the fish oils, the multivitamins, but none of them specifically for my brain. Um, what I find that I need to do to myself is get sort of gets back to my point I was making earlier, which is I push myself to do things I'm not comfortable doing, mm -hmm. right? This is not uh, something I would choose to do tonight. Um, you know, I'd I'm a homebody, uh, but I know it's good for me to get out and, and you know, do social things, uh, talk and interact with, with other people. So as much as I would love to stay, you know, in the house. At and, home. Yeah, at home. Um, that's an example of where I, I say to myself, okay, this is what you want to do, but what should you do? And I try and push myself to do some of those things. All right. Thanks for getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Hopefully we made you a little bit younger tonight. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this live edition of TGen Talks. It's a special one. We don't usually have a studio audience. Every month, we talk to a TGen scientist about an area that she or he is researching. You can find those podcasts on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks for being a part of this inaugural TGen Talks Live. We'll see you next time.